DW, World in Progress. With Sarah Stephan. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Sarah Stephan. This week, we're exploring unique and lost places around the world. Have you heard of the castle ghost town in Turkey, where over 500 little fairy tale castles are just, well, sitting there, completely empty? So, what happened? Some residents weren't happy about the project right from the get go. Should we be blunt about it? We weren't happy about it being built here at all. If you ask why, one answer would be the fact that they cut down the forests. Residents in Yemen are trying to keep their UNESCO heritage alive. 500-year-old madhouses. We do indeed have many challenges, especially when it comes to the climate. The city's residents actually benefit from seasonal rainfall, but now it's raining an alarming amount. This has consequences for the city, as it is built from mud brick. It has to be renovated constantly, and that requires the involvement of organizations. We, the residents of Shibam, want to preserve the city, not just for us, but for the whole world. And how transplanting temples in Egypt helped preserve them in the long run? Of course, the moving itself of the Abu Simbel temple was very important, and as well as the temple of Philae, Kalapsha, Amadan, Wadi Subura. So all these temples were saved. It shows also, and it also gave the momentum to UNESCO because it was the first big project. All that and more coming up now. And we start the show in Turkey at one of those lost places. In the country's northwest, sort of halfway between Istanbul and Ankara, lies the town of Mudurno. Once upon a time, to borrow the wording of fairy tales here, there were plans to build some 700 mini castles. Burj al Babas was supposed to be full of luxury. In the end, some 500 of these castles were built, but the project was never finished. It's been years, and the castles have been pretty much just sitting there. Benjamin Weber went to take a look. Neil King has the story. On the side of a country road about halfway between Istanbul and Ankara lies the unfinished neighborhood of Bush al Babas. Motorcyclists turn the corner, stop and take photos. A woman from Italy named Ilaria is really excited. Uh, I think that uh, it's not possible something like this. More than 500 little fairy tale castles rise up from the hilly landscape. They're built close together, each one with its own turret. Ilaria says it reminds her of Walt Disney. She loves it. Yeah, so much. Yeah. It's like something like uh, the castle of uh, uh, Walt Disney. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Sitting under the shade of a tree, three senior citizens from the neighboring village of Modurno are having a picnic. They're not as excited about the site. <laughs> The architecture clashes with ours. No one from Turkey would live here. No offense, but these houses don't fit with our standard of living. Regardless of whether these castles are beautiful or not, they are a long way off from being lived in. The only people currently on the sprawling premises are two security guards at the entrance. This gated community still isn't finished, and it's been this way for five years. The grass has grown several meters tall. The Turkish construction company Sarot originally planned on building these luxury castles for the Arabian market. 732 in total, to be exact, complete with whirlpools and heated floors. A spa was in the works, and so was a shopping center. Over 200 million US dollars were invested in the project. Today, the only part of the shopping center that's been built is its concrete frame. The woman here on a picnic is bitter about it. Should we be blunt about it? We weren't happy about it being built here at all. If you ask why, one answer would be the fact that they cut down the forests. Many of the local residents protested against the project, partly also because of the architecture. The region here is known for its old timber-framed houses. Many viewed the fantasy neo-Gothic constructions as an outrage. The case went to court. 
and Turkey now has a law intended to protect its traditional architecture. However, that law can't be applied retroactively. But this local antiques seller was open to the project. At the time, they said Arabs would come here, and that's why they offered language classes at the public education centre. We took an Arabic course there, but those plans have remained a dream. <laughs> a local named Ismail, who runs a blacksmith's shop and sells ovens, also hoped it would work out. <laughs> If they'd finished it, we could have created a second town of Modernu. It was a big investment. I could have opened a business there too, which would have been good for me, of course. But then the economic crisis hit, and the Turkish lira plummeted, making it more expensive to import building materials. If you get past the security guards, you can see that although there are windows in these castle-like homes, the inside is only a shell. Cables hang from the walls. There are no water connections. And the past five years have left their mark. The houses are dirty and damaged, and they're beginning to fall apart. For the residents of Modurno, Bush al-Babas is an eyesore. The empty houses attract, at most, people who watch Mysteries of the Abandoned, and a number of music videos have already been shot against this spectacular backdrop. There are many ideas for what to do with this neighbourhood instead, but the construction company Sarot, which was able to reverse its bankruptcy, has plans of its own. The company's chairman, Messer Jerdelen, told German public broadcaster ARD, Sarot still plans on finishing the project. We need between 60 and 80 million dollars to finish it. Potential partners have already begun inquiring about it. We're also thinking about initially only selling the rights to 350 of the houses. That's currently being reviewed. And once it's been finalized, construction can begin again. But this isn't the first time Yerdelen has said something to this effect over the past few years. And so far, nothing has come of it. Neil King there with a report by Benjamin Weber. And we stay with the topic of housing. Now, in our next story, people are actually living inside of these world-famous mud-brick skyscrapers in Yemen city of Shabam. Many of them are 500 years old and have been a UNESCO World Heritage Site for over four decades. However, war and multiple crises in Yemen have also left their mark on the comparatively peaceful Hadramaut region. Tourists have stopped coming, and preserving the houses is becoming increasingly difficult. Jennifer Collins has this story by Anne Almeling. It's an arduous climb up the narrow and uneven steps to the top floor of this high-rise in Yemen. The house's inhabitants have to feel their way in the darkness, taking each step carefully. There's been another power outage. But the stairwell is also pleasantly cool, a welcome break from the heat outside. The thermometer is showing 40 degrees Celsius, or 104 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperatures aren't that high in these mud houses. No matter how hot it is outside, it's better inside. The buildings have ventilation shafts. The air circulates around the room and cool air flows in. Mohammed Khamis Hawar lives in a narrow house with his family. It has seven floors and as many rooms. The rooms get smaller as you move up the house and are sparsely furnished. Tattered carpets and a few thin mattresses provide the only comfort. Once the capital of eastern Yemen's Hadramaut region, the historic town of Shibam has lost much of its former splendour. Many of Shibam's thousands of residents struggle to earn a living, a common story across Yemen. Still, Mohammed wants to stay here. From the roof terrace of his old building, he looks out across the city's famous mud-brick skyscrapers. Shibam is my mother, my whole life. Even if someone made me an offer to move to Saudi Arabia, I would rather stay in Shabam. I grew up here, I live here, and I will die here. The mud brick skyscrapers are tightly packed together as if they were nestled up against each other. Around 450 buildings the colour of earth and sand stand here. 
like Mohammed's house, Moser Square, and get narrower from floor to floor. The residential towers rise to 25 metres or 82 feet, and our white sheep am has earned the moniker the Manhattan of the Desert. Yet the Yemeni city is much older. Mohammed Faisal Ba Obaid is Shibam's tourism director. He explains the area's history. There were tribes who wanted to take Shibam. The water that surrounds the city when it rains stopped them from doing so. Then, a long time ago, the flood of Hamim took place. People thought about expanding the city, but vertically. That's why the houses were built upwards. Many of Shibam's buildings are around 500 years old. In 1982, the Old Wall City was named a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Shibam's spectacular architecture was once a major draw for tourists, but few visit now. <laughs> Sheep make their way through the narrow alleyways between houses to reach their stables. It's been a tradition for centuries to keep animals in the building's lower floors. The inhabitants of Shibam breed sheep and work in the surrounding fields or as day labourers to survive. Poverty, unemployment and illiteracy are widespread in Yemen. Former long-term ruler Ali Abdallah Saleh squandered the country's oil money on buying the favour of his political opponents instead of spending it on roads, schools and hospitals. That was until he was shot dead in 2017. For years now, various factions have been fighting over power and resources, especially in the north and south of the country. Yemen has long been considered the least developed country in the Arab world. Shibam skyscrapers are a reminder that it wasn't always so. They have already survived five centuries, but today residents are struggling to preserve the houses. Here's Mohammed Faisal Ba Obeid again. We do indeed have many challenges, especially when it comes to the climate. The city's residents actually benefit from seasonal rainfall, but now it's raining an alarming amount. This has consequences for the city, as it is built from mud brick. It has to be renovated constantly, and that requires the involvement of organisations. We, the residents of Shibam, want to preserve the city, not just for us, but for the whole world. In the past, international initiatives have helped to restore and maintain the buildings using mud, wood and lime. Germany has also been involved, but a lack of money and tourists is hindering the long-term preservation of the high-rises. It's late afternoon and temperatures have dropped. The city is waking up. Men from Shibam meet at a cafe in front of the large city gate. Some chat, others smoke water pipes. A few men sit on a carpet outside and play dominoes. Yemen's architectural heritage surrounds them. By contrast, the war that has destroyed the country so badly is far away. A Mohammed Faisal Ba Obeid hopes it stays that way. The city is a travel destination. It's one of Yemen's most important tourism sites, and we see it as a treasure. If you have treasure, you have to look after it. If you want to invest in electricity, then invest in electricity. But if you invest in this city, you will also profit, because you are preserving a treasure that belongs to the people. It is our pride and joy. Jennifer Collins presenting a report by Anna Almeling. Some 60 years ago, a team of engineers, architects and archaeologists came together in Egypt to try to pull together a spectacular rescue operation. Ancient temples were about to sink into the waters of the Nasser Reservoir and would have been lost forever. The operation is still regarded as a technical masterpiece and signaled the start of the UNESCO World Heritage concept. Here's Ben Russell with a report by Jürgen Striak. In the 1960s, German architect Peter Grossmann was lucky enough to marvel at the Abu Simbel Temple Complex, where it had stood for over three millennia, just a few meters from River Nile. He talked about the experience a few years before his death. We traveled there by boat. We could already see the Abu Simbel Temple, 
when we were still 25 kilometers away from it. We also had a gauge for how big it was as we were traveling through the Nile Valley with high desert on both sides. But the temple couldn't stay where it was. Let's go back in time to the rescue operation. In 1953, Egypt decided to build a new dam on the Nile River near the city of Aswan. Construction was slated to start in 1960 and the race against time began. The ancient temples had to be moved or they could disappear forever in the floodwaters of the new reservoir. Egypt turned to the United Nations cultural organization UNESCO for help. UNESCO appealed to the world, asking for financial and technical help to save and relocate the temple complex. On November 17, 1963, an international consortium of companies was commissioned to dismantle the temples and rebuild them on higher ground. Pharaoh Ramses II had the temple complex built in the 13th century BC. Its statues and reliefs were carved out of solid rock, with the interiors reaching 60 meters deep into the sandstone cliff. The relocation plan involved cutting up the temples and sculptures into over 1,000 transportable blocks, each weighing up to 30 tons. An enormous logistical challenge for architect Grossmann, who was involved in the efforts. You start dismantling things from the top, but reconstruction starts from the bottom. That means you have to store everything temporarily. Of course, they needed an incredible amount of land to store the stone blocks. West German TV channels were proudly reporting on German experts involved in the rescue mission. An expert from Rhineland Palatinate, the quarry owner and master stonemason Konrad Müller from Kaiserslautern, is also involved in this unprecedented project. My job is to investigate how the two temples, hewn from solid rock, can be cut into the largest possible pieces. Italian specialists carefully cut up the four famous statues to the front of the temple complex. They are 21 meters tall and depict Ramses the Great. Egyptian craftsmen had to make precise cuts into the sandstone, just four millimeters wide, explains architect Hamdi al sutohi The team completed the rescue mission in 1968. Today, the two majestic temples stand 64 meters higher than before and 180 meters further inland, in a safe, dry place, under a huge dome clad in natural stone. Dietrich Rauer, former director of the German Archaeological Institute in Cairo, explains. This dome is a supporting measure, so to speak, because these interiors contained reliefs, of course. These reliefs now hang from long steel struts. It's a technical solution that gives you an impression of what it was like originally, if you're standing right in front of them. The temples also retain their former geographical orientation so that twice a year, the sun's rays continue to shine into the temple and light up its inner sanctuary. This spectacular rescue mission had another outcome too, the adoption of the UNESCO World Heritage Convention in 1972. Renowned Egyptian archaeologist Monica Hanna explains why this was such a milestone. Of course, the moving itself of the Abu Simbel temple was very important, and as well as the temple of Philae, Kalapsha, Amadan Wadi Subura. So all these temples were saved. It shows also, and it also gave the momentum to UNESCO because it was the first big project that UNESCO does. The Abu Simbel temples gained world heritage status in 1979. Ben Russell with a report by Jürgen Striak. When we return, we hear about remote villages in India that have become famous, not for their buildings, but for prostitution. There are an estimated 3 million sex workers in India, aged between 15 and 35. For many, it's the only way of earning money, for themselves and often for their entire families. In part because the Indian caste system and age-old prejudices make it hard for them to escape poverty. Some are working hard toward breaking the cycle. Evelyn McLafferty has more, in this report by Akanksha Saxena. 
In the small village of Kegoli in the district of Alwar in the state of Rajasthan, a three hours drive south of India's capital, New Delhi, Ankita, which is not her real name, works as a sex worker. She looks very young, but is of legal age, she says. And at her home, which she shares with her family, she's getting ready for a client. She looks into a purple plastic mirror and puts on lipstick. She has her nose and ears pierced and is wearing heavy eyeliner. Her clients include men from nearby villages, truck drivers or migrant workers that pass through on the highways and young men with disposable incomes. She joined the profession three years ago and says it was by choice because it means she can support her family. I know from my father that my aunt also worked like this. I got into this field due to poverty. How much are you earning at the moment? About 60 to 70,000 rupees per month, around 750 euros. Apart from me, no one in my family can find work. We were starving. We need a roof over our heads. We need to build a house. And my sister needs to get married. Do you have any debt? I paid it all off. How much was it? About 11,000 euros. Oh, that's a lot. Did you pay that back? Yes, everything. Within two years? Three years. Having to borrow money traps many families here in a vicious cycle. Banks don't lend money since they don't consider sex work as work. So these families turn to local lenders. These local lenders charge exorbitant interest rates, making families here even poorer. Ratna, whose name we have also changed to protect her identity, is the eldest of a total of seven siblings. Due to high debt, she has to work as a prostitute, like her mother and her aunt. I was 15 when I understood what it was all about. And at the same time, it became more and more clear to me how poor we are. So I got in. What was the situation? My little siblings always had to beg for food. We have no real house, no land, nothing. At some point, the money that my mother earned here as a sex worker didn't suffice. So she had to go to Mumbai. In hotels, you can earn more. She had to leave us alone to do so. It became clear to me that it was the only way to make money and essentially for us to survive. One day, I finally said to her, I don't want you to do this. I will take care of this. I am now the breadwinner of this family. Rachna went to Mumbai through an agent who recruited her by contacting local pimps in an elaborate sex trade network. There are an estimated 3 million sex workers in India between the ages of 15 and 35. Sex work is legal in the country. Pimping and human trafficking are not. But the police turn a blind eye. This is a matter of survival for many like Rachna. They are abused in this system, but stay for a lack of any other avenues of work. When I was very young, I had a client in Mumbai who treated me horribly. He wouldn't even pay me. Instead, he beat me black and blue and even stole my clothes. I ran after him, but couldn't take them back. It was extremely humiliating. All of these women belong to the bottom of the caste hierarchy. And because of this, there is huge stigma in the places in which they're from and live in. In villages like Nats, Badia, Barchada and Najir, people were traditionally nomadic tribes moving from place to place. They're scattered all over now, but a large proportion of them have settled in the states of Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Haniya and Uttar Pradesh. Before the women were driven into sex work, these ethnic groups worked mainly as performers, dancers, jugglers, acrobats and magicians. Because of their work and way of life, the British colonial rulers viewed these ethnic groups as a threat. And in 1871, they were criminalised under the Criminal Tribes Act, which was only repealed at the time of India's independence. Stereotypes about these tribes still exist in Indian society today and make it almost impossible for them to start other professions or find other ways of financially supporting themselves. Two male members of a family from one of the villages spoke to us. Sitting on a bed in a home where walls are painted pink, Vikas speaks for both men. 
There is a lot of discrimination. No one wants to give us decent jobs. That would mean we could climb up and out of our misery. People don't want that. So there's no change. How do you determine that? How is this noticeable in everyday life? They won't even stand or walk next to us because we belong to a low caste. They tell us to go away. But it's getting better as more and more of us push to go to school. In school, nobody would sit next to me. I wouldn't even show my ID card, fearing retaliation and humiliation because of our caste. Some children here don't know who their father is. The mother's customers don't give names. But this is a problem, because in many places, you can only be officially registered with your father's name. So these kids fall through the cracks. But women have been able to challenge some gender roles by becoming the primary breadwinner. Here's Vikas again. Those who make money are strong. Our women are strong. They support the family. They call the shots. The women are ahead of us here. They are immensely respected. These women are able to bring income to the families, build properties and make homes. They can pay off family debts, which not many women in India can do. Some eventually leave the village and move to the country's major urban centres, to Delhi, Mumbai or Calcutta. Some even go as far as Dubai. Husbands, fathers and brothers of the sex workers are involved in supporting this sex trade and in contributing to the family finances. They act as pimps, but also do house chores and raise children. But there are women who are completely on their own. And this can be difficult, especially when they get older. Most of the women we spoke to would like to move on from this life. Ankita dreams of marriage when she is done helping her family. Rachna does everything to give her child a decent education, which she hopes could pave her way to freedom. However, something is slowly changing in the villages. Gudu Nagar is a teacher who was supported by an NGO working to end sex work. In a classroom full of young girls dressed in white and writing on a white board, he takes centre stage. He believes a good education will help the women find safer ways of employment. This has already worked for a few families. One girl even managed to get into the police force in Jaipur the nearest major city. Another family has several children in medical professions. One boy is a lab technician, two girls are studying, one is going to become a doctor. In these families, no woman works as a sex worker. Gudu belongs to the same tribes. His relatives were in the sex work too. He wanted to break the cycle. He started by teaching himself to read and write, and then his relatives. Our nomadic way of life was one of the reasons it was too difficult for us to escape our misery. I have four brothers, none of whom went to school, and some of my sisters are still illiterate. I was lucky. After I had taught myself a few things, a social worker from an NGO helped me. Today, I have an official degree and can work as a teacher. There are stories like this, but few and far between. But despite this, a younger generation is hopeful of changing their destiny. In Goody's classroom, Nancy, who has her hair in two plaits, tells us about her dream. Why an air hostess? Because you want to fly. Though the caste system is deeply rooted here in India and the lower caste hugely discriminated against, people here in these villages are hoping for a better future. A future that, with education and knowing their rights, will allow women and men from these communities the opportunities that are part of their human rights. Evelyn McLafferty presenting that report by Akanksha Saxena. That's our show this week. You can find our radio shows and podcasts also on YouTube now. Just search for DW Podcasts. Or, as always, check us out via your favorite podcast player. Today's studio tech was Jürgen Kuhn. I'm your host, Sarah Steffen. Bye for now. Bye for now.